Welcome to lecture 6.3, Polynomials and Irreducibility. In this lecture, we're going to lay the groundwork necessary to connect the field theory that we've learned in the previous two lectures to roots of polynomials, and then to the fundamental theorem of Galois theory and solvability of polynomials in the next two lectures. So let's begin. Here's a definition that I am sure you know very well. Suppose x is an unknown variable then a polynomial is a function, f of x, it's a n, x to the n, all the way down to a x 1 times a naught. Nothing different than what you learned in calculus. The highest non-zero power of n is called the degree of f, also just like calculus, or just like high school algebra. We can assume that all of our coefficients a i lie in a field f. For example, even if each coefficient ai is, is an integer, and the integers are not a field, because we can't divide integers and remain in the set, we could alternatively say that the ais are rationals, and that's a field, or reals, or complex numbers. We can always just expand our set until we get a field. Let big F of x denote the set of polynomials with coefficients in f. We call this the set of polynomials over f. Now, it's worth noting that even though I just defined this using f, sort of implying that f is a field, it doesn't have to be. Even though the integer z is not a field, we can still write zx like this, or z bracket x, to be the set of polynomials with integer coefficients. Most polynomials we encounter have integer coefficients anyways. And even if they have rational coefficients, we can always multiply by a big enough scalar to make them all integers, and that doesn't change the roots at all. As you know, the roots of low-degree polynomials can be expressed using arithmetic and radicals. For example, the roots of the polynomial f of x equals 5x to the fourth minus 18x squared minus 27 are these plus or minus square root of 6 root 6 plus 9 over 5, and plus or minus square root of 9 minus 6 root 6 over 5. Notice that the operations of arithmetic and radicals are really the only way we have to write down generic complex numbers. Thus, if there is some number that cannot be expressed using radicals, and we have no way to express it unless we invent a special symbol for it, like pi or e or something like that. Now, forgive me for going off on this fun fact tangent, but I just can't resist because it's a really weird thing to think about, and it's really cool. So a computer program, when you get down to it, is just a string of zeros and ones. Now, not every string is going to be a legal computer program, but every program is a string of zeros and ones. So how many such programs are there? Well, there are, there is a countably infinite number of finite strings of zeros and ones. Now, if you haven't learned about different sizes of infinity, then this won't make much sense to you. I encourage you to pause this lecture and Google it. It's a really cool, really weird topic. I mean, who knew there were different sizes of, of infinity? But the smallest size is the size of the integers or the natural numbers and is called countably infinite and that's how many finite length strings of zeros and ones there are. So there are only countably infinite many possible computer programs. In existence, in theory, that's, there's countably infinite many programs. However, the real numbers is an uncountable set. So there, there are numbers out there. In fact, almost all numbers, and yes, that can be formalized, almost all. With pro if you pick a random number with probability one, that number can never be expressed algorithmically by a computer program. Such numbers are called uncomputable. So essentially every number out there that's not like a fraction or a radical or something, almost every one of them, they're there. But there is no possible way ever to write a computer program that will output that number. Isn't that cool? I find that just hard to believe, but it absolutely has to be true. Okay, let's get back to topic. 
A complex number is said to be algebraic over the rationals. Usually we don't say over the rationals is understood if it is the root of some polynomial with integer coefficients. Actually, technically, I should say with rational coefficients, although as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter. If it's the root of a polynomial with integer coefficients, then it's one with rational coefficients and vice versa. You can just always multiply by the LCM of the coefficients. The set A of all algebraic numbers forms a field. Now, this is not immediately obvious. It's not cl clear that if you have a number which is a root of x to the 10th minus 13x squared plus 3 and a root of a polynomial x to the 101 minus 8x to the 50th plus 14, it's not at all clear that a root of this plus a root of this or plus the root of this times 15 times a root of this is going to be a root of some other polynomial with rational or integer coefficients. That's not at all obvious, but I will state it as a fact. And a number that is not algebraic over Q, things like pi, E, or the golden ratio, phi, these things are called transcendental. And it's also not obvious right away that these numbers are not secretly the root of some polynomials, but that is a well-known fact, that these numbers are indeed transcendental. Now, every number that can be expressed from the natural numbers using arithmetic and radicals is algebraic. That's not hard to see. For example, consider the following. Suppose x is the fifth root of 1 plus the square root of negative 3. That's a non-real complex number. Then we can take the fifth root of both sides, and we can write that as x to the fifth equals 1 plus root negative 3. We can isolate the radical on one side of the equation. Then we can square both sides to eliminate it. And now when I multiply out and put everything on one side of the equation, I get a polynomial in x. This is a polynomial, and clearly our original number is a root of this. So hopefully this convinces you that every number that can be expressed from the natural numbers using arithmetic and radicals is algebraic, meaning it's the root of a polynomial. However, the next natural question to ask is, is the converse true? Can all algebraic numbers be expressed using radicals? That's not at all clear, and it actually was unsolved until the early 1800s when Galois came around. And this is the question that Galois solved by answering no. And he showed how you can have a degree 5 polynomial. And not just existence, he constructed degree 5 polynomials with the property that none of their roots could be expressed using radicals like this. And that's what people were trying to do. Because if, if all algebraic numbers could be expressed using radicals, then we should have formulas for the roots of any degree n polynomial. And so when Galois proved that that was impossible for degree 5 polynomials, he established that there is no formula for the roots of a general quintic equation. Here are some ways to visualize the relationships between different fields or just different sets of numbers, because the natural numbers is not a field. So over here in the left, we see how the rational numbers are contained in the real numbers, and the real numbers are contained in the complex numbers. Now, there's a lot of fields that lie between here. For example, if I were to include q adjoined root 2, I could stick that between here, and there's tons of other things, but I'm just not going to. So this is called a Hasse diagram, or a partially ordered set. It's technically not a lattice. It doesn't have enough nice structure, but that's a technicality that I don't don't need to deal with. This is just a way to see that C contains R contains Q. And then over here we have another example where there are natural numbers, not a field, but that contains, or it's contained in the rational numbers. The rationals are contained in the algebraic numbers. 
Now, I have not included the reels over here because the reels would not lie in between here or between here um, because there are algebraic numbers that are not real. Things like i, square root of negative 1, and there are real numbers like pi that are not algebraic. So if I had to, I would, ha I would have to put the, the real numbers maybe over here, r, and then this thing would have to, there'd be a line right there, and then I would have to put a, a line here. But there's, there's other things, like suppose I wanted to put q adjoined root 2. So here's q adjoined root 2. Well, then I would, th that contains q, it's contained in r, but look, it's also contained in the algebraic number, so I could add this, this thing here. So clearly you can throw in infinitely many different fields in here. So I'm only throwing in a few, just so you can see some of the more common ones and how they sit together. So the question that I posed in the previous lecture said, are there, so if you start with Q and you throw in only the numbers that are expressible using radicals, do you go all the way up here? Or do you just go part of the way up? Now I threw it off to the side just because I couldn't fit it in here. So in other words, is, is this set here, what you get by using radicals, equal to A? Or is it not? In other words, are there things in between here? And Galois proved that it is not. That if you go up here, this is a proper subset of the algebraic numbers. Because there are, there are roots of degree 5 polynomials that lie up in here, but not in there. So this is sort of a picture of what Galois and others were trying to understand in their day. Let's return to polynomials. Here's a definition. We say that a field F is algebraically closed if for any polynomial over that field, all of the roots of the polynomial lie in the field. Let's start with some non-examples. The rationals are not algebraically closed because x squared minus 2 is a polynomial over q, and it has a root, say the square root of 2, that is not in q. So it's not algebraically closed. Another non-example. The real numbers are not algebraically closed because we can take a polynomial like x squared plus 1. That's a polynomial over r, but it has a root, the square root of negative 1, which is not in r. The so-called fundamental theorem of algebra is something that you know very well, but probably not by this name. It says that the complex numbers are algebraically closed. In other words, every polynomial over the integers, or even more so, you can absolutely replace this, say, over the complex numbers. But again, we don't usually think of polynomials with real, with like irrational coefficients or imaginary coefficients. We can, we just usually don't encounter them, so it's convenient to write over the integers. But Every polynomial over the integers or over the complex numbers completely factors, or we say splits, over C. And this is something that you know. You know that a polynomial of degree n has n complex roots, not counting multiplicity. Or counting mul multiplicity, I guess, if, depending on how you, how you say it. In other words, every polynomial f of x can be written, can be factored like that. That's something you learned in high school. And that is actually called the fundamental theorem of algebra in our language we are saying that the complex numbers are algebraically closed. Now, conversely, if we have a field that is not algebraically closed, then there are polynomials over that field that do not split into linear factors. So things that we cannot necessarily break up like this. Now, before we move on to some irreducible polynomials, let's do some examples just to warm up of some polynomials over C. So recall that complex roots of a polynomial come in conjugate pairs. This is also something you probably learned in high school. In other words, if a plus bi is a root, then so is a minus bi. This fact has a nice graphical interpretation. And I think it's best to show this with an example. So here are some of the roots of polynomials from degrees 2 to degree 5 plotted in the complex plane. The fact that roots come in conjugate pairs means that if you plot the roots, 
this is symmetric about the real axis or the x-axis. So these two roots are symmetric about the axis as are these two roots down here, as are these two and these two and these two right here. So again, nothing you don't know before. I'm just warming you up, getting you used to complex numbers again. Let's come back to irreducibility now. So a polynomial, f of x, over a field, big F, is reducible over that field if we can factor it as a product of two polynomials, say g times h, of strictly lower degree. If f is not reducible, then we say it is irreducible over f. For example, x squared minus x minus 6 factors over q, so it is reducible. x to the fourth plus 5x squared plus 4, that factors. So this is reducible over q, but it has no roots in q. I'm not saying that we can fully factor it or we can split it into linear factors, but this thing is reducible because it splits into two terms of lower degree x cubed minus 2 is irreducible over q. There are three roots in this. None of them are rational. There's no way to break this up into a product of lower degree polynomials. If you wanted to prove this, well, you could say that if you could factor this polynomial of degree 3, then one of the factors would have degree 1. But x cubed minus 2 has no roots in q. So when you have degree 4 polynomial, it's possible that you could factor it but not have any roots in your base field. But when you have a degree 3 polynomial, that's not the case, because you would have to break it up as a product of a degree 2 and a degree 1 term, and the degree 1 term would imply that there is a root in the field. So here are some basic facts. If the degree of f is greater than 1 and has a root in f, then it is reducible over f. Well, I guess it if it's equal to 1, that's trivially true as well. Every polynomial over z is reducible over q. That's, that's just the fundamental theorem of algebra. It's another way to state it. And finally, something I said just a minute ago, if we have a degree 2 or degree 3 polynomial, then it is reducible over f if and only if it has a root in f. And recall why this is. Because if you can write it as g of x times h of x, and both of these have degree lower than f, then one of them has degree 2, one has degree 1. And let's suppose that h of x has degree 1. That means it is h or x minus, say, alpha. And then by definition, alpha has to be in f. One thing you could ask is, are there any simple ways to determine conclusively whether a polynomial is irreducible or not? And the answer is no, but there are useful techniques that will do the trick a lot of the time. Let's start with a lemma. This lemma says if f is a irreducible polynomial over z, then it is also irreducible over q. Equivalently, if you take the contrapositive of this statement, this says if you can factor f over q, then you can factor it over z. This isn't hard to prove, but it's definitely non-trivial if you think about it. Because if, if there's a way to factor a polynomial with rational coefficients, it's not clear that you can necessarily do that with integer coefficients. And here we're assuming that the coefficients of the polynomial are integers. I actually probably should have included a proof, but because we're not doing Galois theory in as much depth as we are the other topics. It's something that's usually reserved for a second semester algebra class or even a graduate class. A couple of results like this I'm going to leave unproven. Now this lemma is very useful for proving a technique called Eisenstein's criterion for irreducibility. This says that if we have a polynomial over the integers, then it is irreducible if this particular condition holds for some prime p. First, we need p to not divide the leading coefficient, an. 
P has to divide every other coefficient. So a n minus 1 all the way down to a naught. And finally, p squared cannot divide this last coefficient. If all three of those things hold for some prime p, then we have a yes certificate saying f is irreducible. Now, this is not an if and only if. So there are plenty of irreducible polynomials. For example, we've seen one. We, we saw x squared plus x plus 1, for which there is no prime p such that these conditions hold, clearly because all the coefficients are 1. Also, there are reducible polynomials for which this condition does not hold for any prime p, but we can't necessarily use that to conclude that the polynomial is reducible. So this works for certain classes of polynomials. It's a useful tool, but it's not 100% conclusive for all polynomials. As an example of this, Eisenstein's criterion tells us that the following polynomial, x to the 10th plus 4x to the 7th plus 18x plus 14, is irreducible. Why? Well, what's the prime that does the trick? How about 2? 2 does not divide the leading coefficient. It divides 4, divides 18, divides 14, but 2 squared, or 4, does not divide 14. The proof of this is not that hard. But again, it's one of those things that I'm going to omit from this class because I want to focus on the main ideas of Galois theory instead of proving everything up to it, which would take a very long time because later there will be a lot of lemmas and results that are technical and that we are going to skip the proofs of. Let me summarize with a remark that I've already said. If Eisenstein's criterion fails for all primes p, that does not necessarily imply that p is ir irreducible. For example, here is the same polynomial that I mentioned a minute ago it is irreducible over Q, but Eisenstein's cannot detect this. Or at least it doesn't seem like Eisenstein's can detect this. Let me show you something kind of sneaky. Let me take f of x and let me change variables. Let me write f of x plus 7. And let me write this, so this is x squared plus 14x plus 49, right? That's x plus 7 squared, and then plus x, so that's going to be plus x plus 7, and then plus 1. Now let's simplify this. This is x squared. 14 plus x is 15 plus 15x, 49 plus 7, plus 1 is 57, plus 57. And now we have a polynomial. And does Eisenstein's work on this? Is there a prime that divides both of these terms, but the square does not divide this one? Well, how about p equals 3? 3 divides 15, 3 divides 57, and 3 squared, which is 9, does not divide 57. So this polynomial, in fact, is irreducible because it's, by changing variables, we get to this polynomial right here. So sometimes you can play around with it, and Eisenstein's can work when it initially appears that it will fail. At this point, I want to return to a topic that I mentioned briefly in the first lecture and promised to return to. That is, extension fields as vector spaces. So recall that a, a vector space over Q is a set of vectors V with two conditions. If U and V are vectors in our space, then their sum has to be in your space. So your vector space is closed under addition, and it's closed under scalar multiplication, meaning if we have a, a vector in the space and a scalar in Q, then C times V is in the space. And here I defined a vector space over Q. It can be defined over any field, just replace Q with another field. The most common examples are vector spaces over R, the reals, or over the complex numbers. And that's typically how you probably saw it if you took linear algebra. The field Q adjoined root 2 
is a two-dimensional vector space over Q. Remember that Q adjoined root 2 is a set of all numbers of the form A plus B root 2. Now it's two-dimensional because we have two degrees of freedom. There's this A we can pick at will and this B. And really this isn't any different than if we had written A times V1 plus B times V2. Mathematically, this is a two-dimensional vector space. These things look more like vectors, but th this is the same thing abstractly. This is why we say that 1 and root 2, the set is a basis for Q adjoined root 2 over Q. Because every element in this field can be written as a unique linear combination of these two numbers. Just like in any vector space that has a basis, elements can be written as a unique linear combination of vectors from that basis. Notice that the other field extensions that we've seen are also vector spaces over Q. For example, Q adjoined root 2 and I can be written as a set of numbers of the form A times 1 plus B root 2 plus CI plus D root 2I, where A, B, C, and D are Q. This is a four-dimensional vector space over Q, and it has basis 1, root 2, I, and root 2I. Next, we have Q adjoined zeta and the cube root of 2. Again, where zeta was a primitive third root of unity. That is, as we've said before, it's the set of all numbers of the form a times 1 plus b cube root 2 plus c cube root 4 plus d zeta plus e zeta cube root 2 plus f zeta cube root 4, where all of these coefficients are in Q. This is a six-dimensional vector space over Q, and a basis consists of oh, let me, 1 with all of these, these things here. So namely, cube root of 2, cube root of 4, zeta, zeta cube root of 2, and zeta cube root of 4. So what I just said before, these things have dimension 4 and dimension 6, respectively. Now it's time for a new definition. If E is an extension field of F, then the degree of the extension, which we denote like this, just like index of subgroups, the degree of E over F is how we say it, then that's the dimension of E as a vector space over F. Equivalently, this is the number of terms in the expression for a general element for E using coefficients from F. So for example, using our examples above, we have that the degree of Q adjoined root 2 and I over Q is equal to 4 and the degree of Q adjoined zeta and the cube root of 2 that's a zeta by the way not a 3 over Q equals 6. And you may be wondering, is there any connection between the use of this notation, this colon notation, for degree of the extension, which we also used for the index of a subgroup, especially given that we've seen this very mysterious connection between subgroup lattices and subfield lattices? Well, if you've wondered that, the answer is yes. There is absolutely a reason why we use the same notation for this as we do for index of subgroups. But we're not quite ready to see that just yet. So let's move on with the definition. Let's suppose that we have a number, let's call it R, which is not in a field, but it's algebraic over that field. For example, the square root of 2 is not in the rationals, but it is algebraic over the rationals because it is the root of a polynomial over Q. It's the root of many, many polynomials over Q. So that leads us to the following definition that there might be many polynomials for which this is a root. So let's define the minimal polynomial of R over F to be the irreducible polynomial 
in f of which r is a root. So the irreducible, so it's, the, it's going to be the one of the smallest degree, and I claim that it is unique up to scalar multiplication. And let's try to see why this is. I'm not going to prove it, but I'll give you a hint. Um, also, other people define this just as the unique polynomial of minimal degree. And it's not hard to see why, why you can't have two polynomials of different degrees that are both irreducible, that both have r as a root. I'll let you think about that. But anyways, back to what I was saying. So, so let's suppose we have one minimal polynomial, x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus all the way down to a 1 x plus a naught. Now we're over a field so we can scale our coefficients and however we want to. We can, so we can divide through by this leading coefficient a n and assume that this is monic. And similarly g of x suppose we have a different minimal polynomial a to the n plus let's say it's b to the n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 all the way down to b1 x plus b naught. Now if these are truly different polynomials then I could subtract them like this and I can get something of smaller degree. I can get a n minus 1 minus b n minus 1 to the x the n minus 1 plus all the way down to a1 minus b1 x plus a naught minus b naught. And if the original two polynomials were in fact different, then this is a polynomial of strictly smaller degree which still has r as a root. Now, I haven't proven this because you know, I haven't proven that this is necessarily irreducible. What if this thing breaks up? Well, if it breaks up, then we can take an irreducible component for which r is a root. So, again, not a formal proof, but we're pretty darn close. There's really no pieces that we're missing. So I encourage you to actually write this up for practice. Maybe I'll assign it as a homework. I haven't decided just yet. But hopefully I should give you intuition as to why we can't have two minimal polynomials. Because if we did, we could subtract them and we get something that's smaller. So we, in other words, if we assume that they're not unique, we subtract them, we get something smaller, contradicting the fact that these were minimal to begin with. Let's do some examples. The square root of 2 has minimal polynomial x squared minus 2 over q. Clearly this is irreducible because it doesn't factor or we could just use Eisenstein's. And let me also mention that the degree of q adjoined root 2 over q is equal to 2. And again, that's because the basis is 1 and root 2. In other words, everything has, I'm going to write it like this, 1 and the square root of 2. This is a basis. Equivalently, everything in q adjoined root 2 has the form a plus b root 2. So this is two-dimensional. Remember the definition. This degree is 2 because this as a vector space is two-dimensional over q. Similarly, i, which is the square root of negative 1, has minimal polynomial x squared plus 1 over q. This is clearly irreducible because it's obvious that this complex number is not a rational number, and so this thing cannot factor into linear factors, cannot split. And we've also seen that q adjoined i is a degree 2 extension over q. In this case, our basis is 1 and i. So things have the general form a plus b i. So two-dimensional as well. Next, zeta, which is e to the 2 pi i over 3, has minimal polynomial, as we've seen, x squared plus x plus 1 over q. This, as we've seen, is irreducible, also because it doesn't factor. Or by Eisenstein's, if we make that clever substitution and 
plug in x plus 7 in place of x. But also, notice that this is a degree 2 extension. That is, q adjoined zeta is a degree 2 extension over q, because a general element in this field extension has the form a plus b zeta. So, in other words, a basis consists of 1 and zeta. And I'm not very good at drawing zetas. I'm not sure I will ever be. Finally, the cube root of 2 has minimal polynomial x cubed minus 2 over q and coincidentally the degree of this extension q adjoined the cube root of 2 over q is degree 3. And that's because elements in here have the form a plus b cube root of 2 plus c cube root of 4. In other words, a basis of this one is consists of 1, the cube root of 2, and the cube root of 4. Okay, so notice in all of these cases, the degree of the minimal polynomial is equal to the degree of the field extension. And you may ask, is, is that always the case? Is that why we call this the degree of the extension instead of like the index of the extension? And yes, as we will see shortly, that is going to be a theorem, that the degree of a field extension is always the degree of the minimal polynomial. Let me ask a few more questions. What are the minimal polynomials of the following numbers over Q? So, so what about a negative root 2? Well, that's also a root of x squared minus 2. So it's got the same minimum polynomial as the other root, uh, root 2 does. What about i? Well, that's also a root of x squared plus 1. So it's got the same minimum polynomial. What about zeta squared? Zeta squared is also a root of x squared plus x plus 1. And both of these numbers, th these are the other two roots of this polynomial. So their minimal polynomial, trivially, is x cubed minus 2. Finally, I will conclude by stating formally what I mentioned a minute ago, and I call this the degree theorem. It says that the degree of the extension, q adjoined r, I'm assuming the degree over q, obviously, where r is an algebraic number, is the degree of the minimal polynomial of r. So in other words, it's not a coincidence that the, the degree of these polynomials are equal to the degree of these field extensions. That will always happen.